Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this special conversation to celebrate the opening of the Emily Karma and Ware exhibition. My name is Georgia Close. I'm Head of Learning here at the National Gallery, and I have the very great pleasure of introducing curators Hetty Perkins and Kelly Cole, who will lead the conversation this afternoon. Before I pass to uh, Hetty and Kelly, I'd like to note that we're joined by audiences online today at home as well as in the theatre. We will welcome your questions throughout the conversation using Slido, which is our online Q&A platform. If you're joining us from home online, you can submit your questions via the viewing page. If you're in the theatre, please ensure that your phone is turned to silent and using the gallery's free Wi-Fi, you can head to slido.com and enter the code ENWARE to submit your questions. You'll find the details on the screens on either side of the page. Stage. Kelly, Hetty, thank you so much for leading the conversation today. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, hello, thank you, Georgia, and hello, everyone. Um, nice to see so many familiar faces, friends and family. Um, and can we just begin by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians of this beautiful country where this exhibition is being presented and um, of course Jude Barlow for her wonderful welcome this morning and um, Dr Matilda House and Paul House Girawa for of course always being so welcoming and so gracious um, when we come to their beautiful country. Um, we thought we would um, start this morning by introducing all of ourselves. I'm Hetty Perkins, I'm Aranda and Kalkadoon woman from Central Australia. Hello, I'm from Alice Spring and my name is Louisa Long. Hello, my name is Margaret Long. I come from Melbourne and from area Utopia. Hello. I am a Nangkaran Yalarkra. I am a Nangkaran. I am a Nangkaran. I am a I am a I'll just interpret. Melissa's... Um, saying she's from a Lalgra and a Nungara country. I'm Jenny Green and I live in Melbourne at the moment, but I spent a long time in the country which we're about to talk about. Hello. My name is Jeda and I'm from a country called Alalgra. I'm Josie Kenos. I'm Dalgra. I am Josie Kunos and I'm from Alalgra. Hello, I'm Sophia Lunn. Um, I've been living out bush in Alpara with all of these women for the last couple of years now. Um, but I'm originally from Perth. My name is Jean Wari from Anankara. And I'm Kelly Cole, the other co-curator of this exhibition, and I'm a Warramungalurja woman, and I'm curator of special projects here at the National Gallery of Australia. And particularly this very special project. Um, I also should mention that um, Jenny, um, our co-editor of the the catalogue and a very important collaborator on this exhibition and friends of the family um, is going to provide uh, interpretation and translation for us today. So thank you, Jenny, for doing that work. Um, we'd also like to, uh, we're going to hear a bit more about Utopia Arts Centre in a moment, um, but I just uh, wanted to really pay, um, pay our respects and thanks to the Utopia Arts Centre, the board, the staff, the managers who are here today, Sophia, of course, and Georgie hiding up there. Um, and of course, uh, as I said, all the artists who are here and also in our audience um, for 
making this possible, basically. Not supporting us, just actually enabling it to even happen. So we're really grateful. It's been, you know, it's, it's a, it can be a very challenging task, but um, we're really grateful for your support. And that of DESART, which is the peak body that represents Central Australian Arts Centres. Um, and they too have been, um, you know, critical in supporting this project, as well as being playing a very significant role in the establishment of Utopia Arts Centre a few years ago now. Now I think I'll hand over to Kelly to introduce our film. So we thought we would start um, with a film that is playing in the exhibition, so that for those who have not seen it, we wanted to start here so you can see those big sweeping vistas of country. And also um, we, we, we did an amazing women's camp with all of these ladies in March of this year. Um, and again, that was another extension of our collaboration and finding out stories. Uh, the film was made um, with the footage from Tamarind Tree Pictures, who have worked with us and spent quite a time with these ladies. Also, the beautiful visuals are, um, of the drones are also Dylan Rivers, who is a Cadage man. Um, and that was cut together by our team here at the National Gallery of Australia, Jed Cooper and Sam Cooper. So we'll start with that. Thank you. Camping at Pajim and Marin in the world. Clean them in the chat a lot. Quite well, and when we can look, Maroil all armies when they making colours and they put cold germs their body. That's what we doing now. Today. I told Captain Old Pat and I put a throw in Norwegian. I'll can you wear it. Japan, I 
It's so wonderful to see the one aspect of the culmination of all this work by by the community to um, to this project and of course one part of this um, and the exhibition is another part and we're looking forward to the bigger bigger picture literally that uh, tamarind tree um, will bring to our will bring to our screens so I think we might um, unless anyone wanted to comment on that film we might kind of go back a little bit to the beginning and I just wanted to ask Kelly to tell us a bit about a, you know your personal as well as professional journey to realising this exhibition. Thank you, Hedy Perkins. <laughs> and thank you again to Tem and Tree Pictures for this wonderful footage. Um, it's really interesting when Hedy and I talk about when we first, you know, thought of doing the Emily Kama and Wade exhibition, um, we can't quite remember the date and how long. But we've been working on this for many, many years and we've been working with the community probably for the last 18 months to two years. Um, so obviously, you know, this is a wonderful uh, exhibition of Emily um, Kamaware. We say it's like a living retrospective. Just like you see in that film, everything is still alive. Um, the country is alive, the spirit within that country is alive and these women represent that whole story. Um, we've got in the exhibition, um, there's 92 works in the exhibition, but many of those works are considered one. If you even think about the Alogra suite, there's 22 panels just in that work alone. Uh, and then of course, we've got the amazing summer project, um, which is on the outside of the exhibition in the foyer. So again, I recall meeting Jenny Green and giving her a call in Melbourne one day asking if she would meet me to work on this exhibition with um, Hetty and I. 
And the first question she asked me is, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and that was a good question because back then, this is like two and a half years ago even, I didn't, we didn't really know what we were going to do. But what we did know was her collection is so vast and so amazing in institutions and in private collections. And that was when Hetty and I spent the time trying to work out what paintings and batiks and works on paper that we would include in this exhibition. So what we have here is a, uh, look, in my personal connection, or I should say our personal connection, because I've got my sister, Danielle McLean, here tonight, who, today, who's a part of Tamantry Pictures, and I've also got my beautiful family, my sons in the front row. Um, our connection is a personal connection. Um, my uncle, Robert Ambrose Cole, was a very well-known artist, and he was uh, in, uh, married to Rodney Gooch, and Rodney Gooch worked with the ladies to um, Bartik, to begin with, and then, um, with painting, but I met um, Mbare quite a few times when I was younger. Um, I knew that I was around, surrounded by greatness, but at that point I was, you know, that's back in 89, 90. Um, I wasn't, you know, there was this lot of beautiful women painting. So I've got these fond memories of going out to Utopia when I was about 16, 17 years old, and then always going to my uncle's house and watching the ladies paint there. And we're not just talking about Emily Kamanwari, we're talking about Gloria Pajada, Ada Bird, all of these ladies' family. So, yeah, so putting that exhibition, working with, you know, institutions and lenders. And from what you've said, Kelly, um, going to the house and seeing all the ladies sitting down together, painting, which reminds us of, of, of how you describe the batik um, process too. Jenny, we'll see some photos of that. We'll talk about that soon. Um, but it strikes me that that was a bit like a what is a modern-day art centre before they kind of... Well, they, some had been invented by then, but they wasn't such a feature of, the, of our cultural landscape as it is today. Um, Sophia, do you want to tell us a bit about art centre life and also if the ladies feel like telling us about what happens there? We've had the privilege of visiting you at that beautiful art centre and having cups of tea, looking at paintings. <laughs> Hello. Um, so, yeah, I've been out at the art centre for three and a half on four years now, which has been... Um, the honour and privilege of my life to come and spend time with these ladies and get to know them, learn some language. Um, I have the best teachers and guides that there is. Um, but obviously, as these ladies have said, um, the art movement started out there long ago. And there have been many really key and integral people that have come um, and spent a life's work out there working with these amazing women, building careers and building connections, which is fantastic. Um, so it's really great um, that through a long period of consultation, about two years, with Desert, the peak body for central desert art centres, um, it was approached to the community what they wanted, how they wanted their art story represented, um, and it was through an art centre model um, to put you know, the voices of the people that speak their own language and culture for themselves. So it's been really magical to be part of that process and have kind of a central hub within the homelands um, for projects like this to exist, um, which has been really, really special. Yeah. So we did a lot of the consultation in the art centre, but also um, driving troopies full of people and big water tanks and lots of kura and mana out to the desert to do big camps. Um, and which we'll touch on the slide just before, doing some amazing trips um, over to Perth to see the Homes of Court collection, which was unreal. And then, um, yeah, many, many, many country trips with um, the ladies and the curators, which was magic. Do you want to talk about Perth? Anyone? Louise, last Before, while, while you're thinking about talking about Perth, maybe, the, could you just tell us the art centre? So it's it's an ab, it's a Aboriginal owned. Um, Absolutely. Run. So it's um, yeah, we have a Indigenous board, of local people um, from a collection of the homelands. We have over a hundred artists. So these ladies that are represented here in this swathe of country that's represented um, is only one part of the Utopia Sandover region. So it's actually 16 homelands and we'll see a map later on just to get a sense of how vast it is. Um, lots of those countries and stories are interconnected by family and cultural lines. 
Um, so you'll see too from the map how much Emily herself travelled um, and where places that she lived and stayed with various family in different spots around. Um, and yeah, we are not-for-profit federal government funding, which is really great through IVAS, so shout out to them <laughs> and their hard work. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, Sophie. Um, what was it like we saw before when you're looking at that beautiful batik? What was it like for you? Because I imagine sometimes you've seen these works made and then they leave and go to someone's house or someone gallery and you don't necessarily see them again. Was it, well, how did you feel about going to Perth, travelling there and, and looking at all these paintings and batiks? so we went to Perth and we saw all the silk batiks that our our grandmother, our Arangi, whose name was Karma, as well as all the other batiks that had been made by the women from her family. And that batik making process went back a long time to the time when I was working there and, and we'll talk more about that later. So on our Perth trip it was really beautiful because we had access to the Janet Holmes Accord collection and as you can see behind the images you see all these wonderful um, you can pull out the screens and all of these paintings. So we looked at the batiks first and then we started looking at the paintings and again there was a summer project in the left hand corner. I don't know if that changes for you guys. But there's Jedda with her work and is that Judy with her work as well? Judy. Um, and they, we also, anyone want to talk about singing and singing those paintings and how you felt when you saw that old lady's paintings there? Jed. First time and under a regular or a lamp and um party silk and an under one and Martina can or can and now one elegant but not take a bar a car lamp just like a analan in Japanese. I'll get a total color in one cup and yet in a map in a racket and I'll can ring around the Nichigan Park Yanelacher. Yeah. Right. Um, that was the first time that we went to Perth and we saw the old woman's silk batiks. Um, it made us feel in our bodies really sad and we cried. Um, and it was like it was just like her. It was like her. It's like she was there. And it made our bodies feel very emotional to see those batiks. That's beautiful. Um, as you can see here, we've, we were looking at um, all of the part of the process. Kelly, maybe you could talk a bit about just that showing the pictures and um, some of the paintings and doing your, with the catalogue, for instance, how the process around that. Yeah, so like a lot of people talk about consultation, we talk about collaboration because we say that this exhibition could not have been done without these women. 
And so Hetty and I and Jenny went to Utopia quite a few times, again with Tree Pictures. Um, and every, every edition or every um, of the catalogue, so every painting that we selected, we showed it to the ladies. So we would pull out these big photographs of the, um, the paintings and there that's how we found these real true stories of what were in these paintings because these ladies could see what that old lady was painting and they were telling us, revealing those stories to us, which was extraordinary. So here's a photo of me, um, you know, with not Naomi, who I got there. Tishani. Um, and, you know, the younger generation got involved in this. So, again, I'm sitting there with a catalogue, flipping out the pages, showing what painting is going to be in there. But what's really important for us is when we were selecting portraits of Inware to um, put in our catalogue, we wanted to have really beautiful, respectful ones, the ones that she would want to see, you know, um, be happy to see. And these ladies also helped us select these um, beautiful um Portraits, and then also William shots. There's a lot of ladies painted up in uh, not just these modern day, not these contemporary photos, the photos that we have today, but of um, when Inware and some of the older ladies who were past painted up on a William. We wanted to make sure that they were right, that we could put them in, and that every family member said yes to all of those works being in there. So this is being signed off 100%. This is community involvement, um, and it's there you know, catalogue and their exhibition as well. Thanks, Kelly. Um, we were just conscious of the time. Um, we've got the, we, it was mentioned before, Sophia, um, you talked about the breadth of Ingwari's country and, and all the ladies' country here. Um, and we were really fortunate that um, Jenny suggested um, that we commission a map from um, wonderful Brenda, Brenda Thornley who's made this amazing map so that we can understand a little bit better this beautiful country. Jenny, can you talk about uh, your experience of, of, well, being on country but also how it all connects, I guess? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's really... I like maps. <laughs> Lots of different sorts of maps. I've noticed, yeah. um, And I think it's, it's just one way of looking at things. We can think of this sort of map as one way of looking at things. So I hope you can all see it well enough, but if you can't, you will see it in the front of the exhibition. It looks really beautiful, I think, on that wall. So thanks to Brenda Thornley. So Nwara's life world was centred around some of many of the places named on this map. Um, she was born at Alalgra around 1914, and Alalgra's in that yellow triangle, just on the edge of the green bit. So you can look more closely at the map when you have time. A place yes. called Ungutung, which is in the Sandover River, was where she first saw a white fella. And she thought that white fella was Arun Arunj, which is the Anmajara word for monster. And she, she and her um, cousin, I think, were frightened and they ran away. Um, there's another place on the map called Aotakan, which is west, almost halfway to Tea Tree. And that's where Nguare tells a story about running away from a policeman who, was, who had arrested her and she, she escaped and ran all the way back to Alalgra country. So Nguare also lived and worked on some of the stations, station properties in this area. Um, she talks about looking after sheep and nanny goats about smashing up ant bed, which was termite mound, which was used to make a sort of cement-like substance to build houses and make floors and so on. She looked after the kids of station owners and did lots of other jobs. The map also shows you freehold title land. That's the green parts, which are the result of successful land claims over areas of that country. So that's the freehold area. And it also shows the 16 or so homeland communities where many of these artists continue to live. Um, thanks, Jenny. Is, is it possible just to... Well, you mentioned land claims. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the role of um, uh, people in giving evidence at those land claims, like the cultural, that it's, it's, it's part of testimony, isn't it, in a, in a white fellow legal sense? Yes, well, these areas that were claimed, they were claimed under the Northern Territory Land Rights Act, 
And the process of claiming country involves a lot of research by um, anthropologists, linguists, and then people, the family groups, get together and talk in front of the land commissioner, the judge, and they talk about their family connections to each other and to the country. They talk about the places on the country, the different named places that are really important. Soakages, mountains, rivers. Um, and often people do ceremonies too for the judge to show how connected they are to the place. Anybody want to talk for this map or... Hmm? Okay, next one. Yep. Okay, here's, um, again, we were talking about the wonderful um, images that we were able to support, source with the support, again, of, of uh, Jenny and the community. And um, we're going right back to the um, beginnings of the um, Batik movement here, of course. Jenny, I think you might have to start by telling us about that and then we'll ask the ladies about that time. Yeah, so one of the things I was going to say, this exhibition and the publication that accompanies it sourced a lot of archival images from people who were very generous in sharing what they had. And these might have been f including many photos of Utopia in the old days. <clears throat> and on this slide you can see um, a photo of... Emily Carmen Ngware and Lily Ngware making tie-dye at Ngarapa, the Hope Stead at Utopia. And also another photo of the old woman making batik. And the opening slide we had showed a beautiful photo of Ngware on the way to the first batik exhibition in Alice Springs in Mbantua in 1980. And that photo was taken by Tolly Sawenko, who I think was the school teacher for some of the women here way back. Um, so it's been very important to source these things to enrich the exhibition and to also um, talk with community and, and enrich the archives themselves by really making sure that all the people in photos are named properly. If they're named properly, we don't leave people out. And in turn, we feed this information back to the archives so that this can be kept for the future. Will I keep going? Yeah, let's be, uh, ladies, can, if you want to say anything, let us know. Can you say anything about these photos? No, I can't, I'll keep talking. Maybe we'll talk about Bartik on the next slide. But I, I suppose another thing that happened that from the archives was also sourcing and recordings of Nwarai talking and singing. And that was a very, another important layer of the information that is part of this exhibition the film and the conversations about ongoing traditions mm -hmm. and, and, and also the, what's been seen very clearly at the opening of the exhibition and in, in the film and so on is the way people are carrying on those, the legacy of the old woman in, and, and the rest of her family. And so in this image we have Julia, um, Julia Murray. It's in one of, um, one of the shots here, the one on the left-hand side. Um, what was it? I mean, obviously one of the things that strikes me is in the catalogue we have a image of all the ladies going, I think it was, to Adelaide for an exhibition. So quite different, you know, um, quite a different way of presenting the exhibition to presenting one at the National Gallery of Australia. How did you fund um, and how did you sort of organise those exhibitions back in those days? Sold hot dogs. Hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think of doing that. Should have had hot dogs at the cafe. <laughs> so it would have been, was there, um, you know, with the, uh, like there was literacy and numeracy and driving classes and things like that. Um, with, with, yeah, I'm just trying to sort of picture it with little or no support. So what was, um, what was that like? What was, what was the sort of feeling like amongst the community and the ladies doing these new projects? Well, I think it was very exciting. I'll just, maybe I'll just briefly mention a few key points in the history of that process. So the first 
activity that the women joined in was making tie-dye and woodblock printing, as you saw in the first slide, or the previous slide, and that was in 1977. And then um, we all learnt Batik together, um, and we were taught by Suzanne Bryce and a, a woman, a Pittendout woman called Kunjitja Brown, or Yipati, who was from Frigon, and had, she had learnt Batik at Erna Bella in a, work, a Batik workshop that had been there for several years, many years, in fact. So then in 1978, Julia Murray, who's pictured making batik on this slide, um, along with Violet Pichada, who's in the front, and Violet's also in the film you just saw. So Julia managed to, by some miracle, to get some really more secure funding in 78, and she was the founding coordinator of the Utopia Women's Batik Group. So she kept it going um, after that initial learning time and, and, and so on. Um, in this slide, you can also see the, the tools, one of the tools that's used, or you can see the um, janting, which is the little um, metal copper pipe that's used to direct the wax onto the fabric. And in the lower two parts of the slide, you can see warai um, and another warai putting the waxed fabric in the dye and then hanging it out to dry on the bushes, which might be a nookature. But maybe at this point we should go back to the homestead photo where Julia and um, Violet are doing Bartik. No, no, next slide. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Do any of you want to talk about that? Do you want to talk? Mm. Where were you that time, Jetta? It's your time. <coughs> the school of good football. Mm. Cold up an alpamana, a rich alpamana in party in poor Dunnage. So, Jed is saying that um, they really enjoyed watching Wadai, old woman Wadai, making the batik, and they, after school, they would go and watch the women making batik. And just for a bit of context, if you went to the your left of that photo, there's a big Silver Caravan, which was the Utopia School in those days. So the Bartik activities happened close up to the old school. What? A... And Rosemary and Nora, three better than Manaka, Carlon Barden. I Colour of the clean of the yellow and white, silk one wing on it, red and purple, orange, and then a colour of low jet, fuck it, quite in what water no polar in it, different, different work, silk one when I call in it, and the other jet. I like and the cut it till. I used to watch the women um, like Barbara and Rosemary and Nora Pichada making batiks, making the silk one. Um, they would wax the fabric and then put it in different coloured dyes. There were, you know, yellow ones and white and purple, red. And after that, they'd boil the wax out of the fabric. That's what I used to see happening. 
More? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think Josie this morning was saying it was hard work. <coughs> that, that that old lady was really a hard worker for that. Um, when we were in the galleries there. So, Jenny, when, why did Ingwari decide to transition to painting with acrylics on canvas? <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a big question. I think uh, th there was one particular time when she said to me very clearly that uh, she explained what hard work Bartik is and I think if you can imagine, um, even as been talked about today, the, 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 the amount of work that's involved in collecting the firewood to, to, and the water to boil the fabric, there's a lot of physical work and I think um, in, in fact, the processes and the dyes and, and all these things, it's very, it's sort of quite intense and complex. Um, I think what I famously, perhaps famously said that she got a bit sick of Bartik, it was too much hard work and she didn't like the amount of rinso that it took to, <laughs> to wash the wax out of the fabric. A waste of rinso, that's a good reason to give up. She said, I changed that. over to painting because we were wasting too much rinso. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of other reasons people could think about why painting became um, the, the main thing people were doing. It's a complex question. We might come back to it later. Yes. And I was thinking it was the eyesight was another, wasn't it? The, that did she say that her eyesight was a bit deteriorating or something and she found the acrylics a bit easier? Yeah, she might have mentioned that, yeah. Um, okay, we might um, have a look at these. Kelly, I might um, ask you to tell us about these two wonderful works, one from the collection of the gallery, of course, and then one from a significant private collection. Um. Well, look, it was really important to start with, you know, um, to include Bartik, obviously, in the exhibition. Like we said, she did 11 years in Bartik prior to even um, painting on canvas. Um, and we've got, you know, three different stages of Bartiks hanging in the exhibition. Um, and in our first room, we start with these wonderful two works here. Um, one to the, the green one, I'm terrible with my left and right, and this is reversed here, so... Oh, okay. So the one on the left, the green one, um, I've, I talked about this in our talk before. This is a work that Julia Murray has um, loaned the gallery for this exhibition. Um, it's one of the earlier Bartiks um, she worked on, I believe. Um, it's a work on cotton. I'm looking at, you know, to be corrected at any point here by Jenny Green. <laughs> so, look, it's a wonderful work. It's a very small work, but it's a work on cotton. It doesn't have that luminosity of works on um, silk, but it's important in the sense of this is one of the works that she first uh, made, um, you know, talked about the, um, I'll stop saying we talked about it. I'm just pretending you've all heard this for the first time. Um, so, you know, the early workshops they did with numeracy and literacy and in what they learning how to write uh, her beautiful script, so a hand across a paper, learning to write. You can sort of, when we saw this, it's that sort of beautiful repetition. It's also like Imare's first script across a beautiful cotton batik. Um, Hedy's asked me the personal connection to this other work. The work is a National Gallery of Australia uh, batik. It's one of the first works we got in our collection um, of Imare. It is a really important work for us. Um, I don't know if you know this, but because they're on textiles, when you've got works on paper and works on textiles, you can't actually display them for very long periods of time because they uh, fade and deteriorate with the light. So this gorgeous work, untitled, um, no titled 1981, has actually uh, travelled quite significantly to uh, our international exhibitions. And actually the last one I was um, ever present, which was curated by my wonderful colleague, Tina Baum, who's here today, who's a Larrakia woman. And Tina took this gorgeous um, work to, uh, it was at, in Auckland as well. And so it's a very significant work for us. Um, you can also see, you know, it's her first time she's actually creating those beautiful linear works. Um, there's also a work in, um, you know, back to personal connection, there's also a work in the um, exhibition from Jenny Green's, uh, has been donated by Jenny Green's family. And I think Jenny Green, or Hetty's going to ask this question. 
No. Uh, Jenny, do you mind if I ask you the story about your mum's um, works that you've... There's a funny story about a batik that was made and you gave to your mum? Oh, yes, quickly. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things about the early batik days is we were making batik on... on like, we were making batik T-shirts. Um, when we were gifted some sewing machines, we made cotton shirts and made batik on those. Um, as well as the cotton and silk lengths. Um, my mother was the recipient of a, a shirt that Karma Mwarei batiked on a very early one um, that she wore for a while. And then, it, you know, the, the trouble with these fabrics and the clothing items is that they're, they're very, they don't, they, they sort of, they're, they're, they wear out. <laughs> But fortunately, some of these things have survived. And my mum's shirt is now in the NGV collection. Um, she did wear it in the garden because it wasn't my sewing that I made the shirt wasn't really, it was, I'm not a very good sewer of shirts, perhaps. But, you know, there's also other things in, that, in the NGV that are things I, I mean, in those days, we would make batiks into trousers. And I know that Perhaps I regret it now, but there was a beautiful batik that what I made that I st stitched into a pair of trousers that I wore for quite a long time, and that's in the NGV collection. <laughs> so I, I think batiks had a very um, stressful life, perhaps because they are they are fragile, and we now we now the conservators are now saying we can't have them in exhibitions for very long because of the destructiveness of the light. So we're very lucky to see them. Um, and we ho I think maybe this exhibition might stimulate people to bring out their batiks too. And, and there might be some more treasures from those times in the 70s, of 80s that, 70s and 80s that can be um, accessed by the public. Gifted. Yes, and gifted to the NGA. <laughs> um, yes, it's been wonderful. We were so delighted when um, Jenny suggested that there might be an early work um, that Julia had in her possession. And um, as you can see, it's, 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 it's very exciting to have this in the show, so thank you for that suggestion. I think I am conscious that we're running out of time, um, so we may not get through all our slides, but I'm just going to say that the catalogue is amazing. Um, and I can say that because I barely did anything to contribute to it. So all credit going to the ladies and to Jenny. Um, but, uh, you know, this is such a rich source of information. But I think we should now just talk about, particularly about Nurla, which I'm conscious my pronunciations are all, all, all out of whack. Can, who would like to tell us what we're looking at here on the screen? No, that Come, rename an old duck. Man and in it, couldn't it? Come, so, um, this is a nulara, um, the plant that Mua Kama Mwara painted. Um, you can see the, the white, the white, the little white pod there is the karma seed that Mwara Karma was named after. Um, and on the right hand side you can see the roots of a nulara, which is called sometimes in English pencil yam, um, the roots that are the f edible part of the plant. So th this is the plant the, this is the plant that Emily Karma Mwara was named after. Um. <clears throat> is there a story about you've got for digging up that one with the old lady? Mm 
So, um, I remember the old woman, Karma, and other people used to dig up the root of the plant and take it back to camp to cook. Um, this plant, the Anulara, originated from the very important country, from the big place. Alala Riki? Alalgra. Um, could you just uh, elaborate a bit on the importance of that, the originating from the place? I'm not yet you or anyone. If what that mean? The I use that as a, originate as a translation for an, a Majuro word, Nganak, which it's it's one of those words that is very hard to translate to do it justice, but. The general principle is of originating, being created in a place. Um, it's a word that's used to talk about the dreamings that emanate from country. So this is the ongoing process of originating and being ever present. Thank you. I think you can feel that in the paintings, really, when, when you look at them. Um, Do we want to? We only have time for maybe one more or two more slides. Is there something people want to talk about? Does anyone think there's things that you might talk about? Do we want to talk about Mranoka Kran the Banganak, Yandoka, Adnular, Akaichir, Ajachur, and Dang Adapranana. Manana Atamadar Kunal, Uruadan Manaran. Tamp make him tamp. So in this slide is indukwa, which is the fan flower, and kaichara, which is a desert raisin, and a grass called alyaicharum, which is a woolly butt grass. Um, what Pichara said is that all of these plants originated in the country. And she also said that the alyaicharum, the seed from the alyaicharum, the woolly butt grass, it's collected and ground up and then cooked and eaten. Tamalalakum. <laughs> 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 Okay, so in Dukwa, the fruit, you can see the bright yellow, slightly hairy fruit. Um, that's a fruit that emus eat. And sometimes people. Sometimes people eat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, 
So that indukwa, the fan flower, um, old lady Carmen Warai painted that as well. And in some of the canvases and perhaps the batiks that are hanging in the exhibition, you can see those as well as the anulara, the pencil yam that she painted. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we have come to a point where we would, some of the people listening and watching want to ask some questions to, to finish today, but we might answer those questions while we look at this beautiful work, um, which um, details where, how these plants we've just looked at influence um, and appear in, in Ingwari's work. Um, so one of the questions that people would like to know is um, that Emily Kamingware's work, art, is loved by people all over the world. How does it feel for you as family to see, to see her, you know, acknowledge, to see people repay that respect in that way? How does it make you feel that she's famous? Arangi can party can in Korean Gorazum. I like Yerkin and Yeland the man in the Pimborum. I like an Grankajin, a Pimborum strong. It makes ourselves, our bodies, our beings feel really happy and strong to see all these artworks by our grandmother. And um, I think I might extend that question. I think it suggests that I know that when you're singing and doing things, you've been listening to those old songs lady singing and is that that that, op, that makes you feel happy and more proud too ara dam ila dinen awo yek in ngat ka kada prana awo nan kon and when they got the chicken park, how will you love it? When we listen to the old woman's songs, her awulya, her women's ceremony songs, it's like it's really real and it's like she's there and it makes us all feel very happy. What? Mm -mm. I was just going to add when um, on Wednesday, when the ladies actually the ladies arrived on Wednesday, but on Thursday we did a private viewing for the the ladies to have a look at the exhibition by themselves, and you know there was a lot of happy. You were really happy. You walked in all the rooms and looked at them, and you know it was a really beautiful emotional time for all of us. So I can attest to how happy they were when they saw that old lady's works. Any other? Another question? It's okay. Um, people were asking about how come uh, painted using brushes or fingers. Um, how that talk maybe talk about some of that change, the way that she would paint maybe from body paint to canvas. Is that something that people would like to talk about? Party green one and a well yagged. I don't look at a well and all in one and the end. Collaborate here a painting all and campus all and being one a gravel in a bit. Him you are cut a bring one again trimming coral and I don't know that I got a well in the cutter under a little one at a party. 
cell call and the Aranak. Um, what I, um, in her Batik work, she painted a woolia, women's ceremonial designs, and then she thought she would change over to canvas. And she also used those Awulia ceremonial designs in the canvas as well. Um, the emu and the Adnulara pencil yam dreamings. Um, so we saw those Awulia designs revealed in the Batiks and in the canvas. Three or four. Pujankal Talkati and Incredible Chattel in Carolandi. Song and Wayly Chat, a quarrel of the Koya and Colonel Villini Chatter or Tichatakan. Aujar and the Lano. He loved for Kazra Aujar and the Chat, a Pokatar and Old Achigan. And another young friend is strong and Anakan. Healthy one had a ten really in Chat. Koya and in a very grand take of one little girl in a kitten. So we um, saw her painting and singing a Woolier at Three Boars, which is on the map. Um, <coughs> women were painting up their thighs and their breasts with a Woolier designs. They were sitting behind a windbreak, so there weren't any houses at that time. And she said to everybody, to the grandchildren, you have to take on, you have to take on and look after this ceremony. What? Well, that's, um, thank you for sharing that story. That's very special. Um, I think we have one time for one more question and it seems appropriate to ask What's next for Utopia Art Centre and Art Centre and artists, of course? Things that you are excited about that might be coming up? Um, so firstly, we're very excited we're getting a building, which is great after four years. <laughs> we're actually going to go visit the building on our way home, so it's going to be very exciting. It's in the yard being built. Um, but... All of these ladies are incredible painters in their own right um, and their work has been exhibited before and will be exhibited again. Um, we have a website where you can purchase their work as well. Um, but most excitingly, we um, have had a really great pleasure working on this project and being here in Canberra. Um, and very excitingly, the exhibition, the next iteration will be at Tate in the UK. So we're getting excited about maybe going over there uh, with these women and perhaps others. Um, would be fantastic to yes, be there. Yes, there's no more Kumanjai, that old lady from that side, the Queen, but still, <laughs> we still go and see her country. <laughs> That other old lady, but um, I think I'll just um, hand over to Kelly now to say something and say thank you. I look at you like I was going to say something. So when Sophie is talking about um, the Emily Kamanwari is going to the Tate, um, I think the date was July 2025. So we are very excited. We only found out that this week. Um, yeah. So we're all going over. Look, I just want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we didn't get to the paintings, but that's okay because you can see the paintings in the exhibition, like I said. Also, um, the exhibition uh, publication we have has got um, extraordinary texts by, you know, Dr Jenny Green, Hetty Perkins and myself, Yamachi Artis, Stephen Gilchrist and also Krishona Smith. But I, I just would like to thank you all for coming today and I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you, the women. Oh, Oh, special thing that we're, just to add more to our workload, the women want to sign catalogues. So if anyone would like to buy a catalogue at the shop, the ladies are going to go down there and sign the catalogue for you. So that's very, what a privilege. Sorry. Thank you all. Join us in thanking the ladies, please. <laughs>